Um, welcome to this second annual Judith Krug Memorial Intellectual Freedom Panel. Um, I'm, I'm Mark McCarthy. I'm a professor at Georgetown's Communication, Culture, and Technology program. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Judith was a driving force in the creation of the Congressional Internet uh, Caucus Advisory Committee. She was a passionate supporter of its mission until she passed away on April 11, 2009. Uh, she was the longtime director of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom and the executive director of the Freedom to Read Foundation. Uh, I think she'd be delighted with today's topic, uh, which is, can the U.S. continue to support a free global internet in the age of WikiLeaks, cyber war, and rampant copyright piracy? Uh, fortunately, we all just heard Howard Schmidt at the luncheon address who uh, assured us that there was no contradiction between internet freedom and all these other worthy goals. Uh, but we'll kick around that topic in today's panel a little bit. Uh, today's panel does have a, a, a distinguished group of, uh, of thinkers, advocates, and scholars. I'll introduce them uh, in, a, in a moment, but I want to set up the issues and uh, then ask them a few questions. And we'll have plenty of time uh, at the end for, uh, for audience participation. Uh, as most of you know, that when the Internet um, first collided with the law, the initial uh, U.S. policy framework was exceptionalism. Uh, the Internet was different. It shouldn't be regulated as stringently as other uh, media should be regulated. It was decentralized, and that meant that everyone could be a speaker. There was no need for the kind of structural or content regulation typical of other uh, media. No fairness doctrine, no ownership limits, no public subsidies for alternative content. None of that was needed. The internet was a, a perfect marketplace of ideas, and the government role was basically to keep out. This um, US internet policy 1.0 had several pillars. First, it, there was the, the uh, uh, First Amendment decision under Reno, uh, substantial uh, immunity for internet intermediaries under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, that provided for a face har har safe harbor in the copyright area. Uh, there's a new direction in internet policy, however, and this is the bordered internet, under which uh, internet intermediaries act to satisfy various local policy concerns, either through specific legal compulsion or voluntarily in conjunction with law enforcement or, or just out of uh, business reputation needs. Increasingly, we are seeing the intermediaries taking action against harmful conduct, conduct by their users with the active support of governments. The internet is such a complex environment that these controls can be exercised at many points. Some examples, uh, Facebook uh, cancels the accounts of those who register fraudulently or who are engaging in cyberbullying. ISPs typically take steps against fraud and child porn. Uh, payment system providers reject transactions involving internet gambling child porn, controlled substances, internet tobacco. They've taken steps against sites that are involved in copyright infringement. They also run dispute resolution mechanisms uh, handling complaints between cardholders and merchants. Domain name providers, uh, they deny service uh, to uh, trademark infringers and distributors of malware. Virtual worlds ban online gambling. Online marketplaces take steps against trademark infringement and fraud, and they also have consumer protection programs and dispute resolution programs. Sometimes, however, intermediary actions on the, on the part are parts of campaigns by governments to control media, to control freedom of assembly, and to control political discourse. A year ago, we witnessed two important events in this area. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had uh, her freedom, global internet freedom speech here in Washington, and Google withdrew from, from, uh, from China. Together, these events seem to represent a warning by U.S. companies and the U.S. government uh, that this new direction in government regulation of the Internet intermediaries might pro pose a threat to Internet freedoms. Other governments, the U.S. seem to be saying, needed to be careful not to step over the freedom of expression line. We're discovering, however, that these challenges are internal as well. The U.S. government and U.S. companies also struggle to draw the line between legitimate action to control Internet harms and infringements on freedom of expression. The WikiLeaks case dramatically illustrates this dilemma. 
in the wake of the release of secret U.S. diplomatic cables, U.S. hosting services and payment processors denied services to WikiLeaks, the organization that had provided these cables to traditional media outlets. This prompted cries of censorship. Some internet activists launched denial of service attacks against the intermediaries. In the face of widespread criticism, a State Department spokesperson was forced to explain that action taken against WikiLeaks had nothing to do with internet freedom since internet freedom does not contradict the rule of law. As many commentators pointed out, however, the actions taken against WikiLeaks took place before the organization had even been formally accused of any violation of law. The issuing of subpoenas for communications involving supporters of WikiLeaks as part of a U.S. investigation has created an international tension uh, by reaching to a member of the Icelandic parliament. The U.S. government and U.S. companies face other challenges in this area. Uh, in the U.S. Congress, uh, there's a consideration of the Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeits Act, which would require various intermediaries to take action against copyright violators <clears throat> after a finding by the U.S. Department of Justice. In addition, the U.S. administration is working with various intermediaries to organize voluntary action against violators of intellectual property laws, uh, including uh, illegal purveyors of pharmaceuticals and various due process issues have been raised in the context of these measures. Uh, as we heard from Howard, uh, Howard Schmidt, a further area where these issues arise is cybersecurity. Now governments look for uh, some help from uh, intermediaries for a variety of reasons, but the, the real reason is simple. Uh, they are often well positioned to take action against those creating problems. The tensions in this effort, however, are that sometimes we don't agree on the nature of the problems. We want the intermediaries to clean up some problems, but not others. And we'd rather that they not interfere with free expression and privacy when they do take action. So um, let's get started. Um, I'll introduce the panel briefly. More detail on them is in your programs. Uh, so first, uh, Milton Mueller is a professor at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. He's an expert on matters of internet governance and the author of several books, including his current book, uh, Networks and States, which lays out some of the challenges facing nation states in the light of the global nature of today's communications networks. David Israelite, uh, is, since 2005, he's been head of the National Music Publishers Association, defending the interest of songwriters and publishers in the music business. Uh, Stuart Baker is the former head of policy at the department of Homeland Security and General Counsel at the National Security Agency. He's the author of Skating on Stilts, Why We Aren't Stopping Tomorrow's Terrorism. And he's a partner at Steptoe and Johnson. And finally, uh, Re Rebecca McKinnon is a noted scholar and advocate in the area of internet freedom. She's a former CNN journalist with stints in Beijing and Tokyo. She's currently a senior fellow at uh, the New America Foundation here in Washington, and she's working on a book on, this, uh, on these issues, which we're all eagerly awaiting, tentatively titled Consent of the Network. Uh, it should be out uh, later this year, or early next year, depending on when Basic Books gets around to it. So, uh, Milton, uh, in, 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 you're an expert on the role of international organizations in internet governance. Um, wh what's your take? What's the role of these institutions like ICANN or uh, the Internet Governance Forum, or even ITU, in resolving the tension between uh, actions by intermediaries uh, to control internet harms uh, and the, the harms to free expression that might be caused by that kind of action. Rather than answering that question directly, um, I, I want to bring us back to the question that defines this panel, because I think it sets up the problematic that uh, that will lead to the correct answer to that question, or at least make my perspective clear. So can the US continue to support a free global internet in the age of WikiLeaks cyber war and rampant copyright piracy? That such a question could even be asked, that we would juxtapose internet freedom on one side and a few allegedly scary problems like WikiLeaks, cybersecurity, and copyright on the other, I think tells me we need to have a dialogue about values and principles 
Um, in fact, I'm surprised pornography is missing from the list. Uh, apparently, it's been dethroned by WikiLeaks. So let's just interrogate that question a bit. What does it mean to stop supporting a free global internet? Should we express solidarity for Chinese and Belarusian internet policies? Or do we fantasize that the US can unilaterally establish a new regime that will somehow impose our view of the proper order on the rest of the world? And you see we're getting to the institutional question here. Before we give up any freedom, can we also at least ask what we're getting in return? So with respect to WikiLeaks, are we giving it up so that we can create a 21st century version of Nixon's plumbers so that no future Daniel Ellsbergs can easily disseminate leaked information about government actions? Is that really what we want to do? Do we think compromising freedom will protect us from cyber war? History suggests that tightening the links between states and communications exacerbates military and political conflict. Besides, our military enemies are not going to abide by any rules and regulations restricting our own freedom. Certainly not going to restrict their freedom. And heck, why is the US worth defending if it doesn't stand for freedom? As for copyright, don't we already have pretty harsh laws, regulations, and global treaties? Haven't we already had enormous dialogues about uh, levels of intermediary regulation uh, and the trade-offs between freedom? Uh, some of the least free internet regimes in the world have not really stopped copyright infringements. So, internetworking is a revolutionary new transnational social capability. It creates enormous benefits and obviously it creates challenging new problems. While we can reject the utopian view that there's no downside, we should also reject the opposite view, the idea that the democratization of ICTs is a threat and that you can lock down the capabilities of a global internet as if it were a small corporate enterprise network. In fact, if you had to choose between an anarchistic cyber utopia and the locked down global authoritarian network, I, I think the latter is far, far more dangerous. But what I'm advocating is that we approach this problem from a transnational perspective, that we try to create new institutions that are organically formed around the polity made up of the internet users and suppliers themselves. And we can see in some of, of a mixed experiment, we've tried to do something like that with ICANN. And in many respects, I think that was better, even though it has enormous problems, than trying to do it, say, through the ITU or through uh, completely unilateral action by the US government. So I'm looking for multi-stakeholder institutions grounded in civil society, democratic, founded on principles of freedom. And I think we can solve those problems in that way, although obviously lots of details to be discussed. Anybody else from the panel who want to jump in on further discussion on that one? The, the, the focus of the question again is what's, what's the role of the international institutions in, in this area? If, if, if there's a balance that has to be struck between intermediary action and internet freedoms, uh, uh, should the IGF be doing something? Should ITU be doing something? Should OECD be doing something? What's, what's the role of these international organizations? And if they do have a role, what would it be like? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I, they represent governments, right? They, they're not representing, it's not world government, it's a bunch of governments getting together. And so they're going to see all of these problems from government's perspective, uh, which doesn't sound like it's promising for uh, internet freedom. Uh, and uh, second, uh, their first question is, what's in it for me? Uh, and they're not going to uh, agree to anything until they've figured out that on the whole, this is good for them and the best possible deal, which means that they aren't gonna agree to anything for 15 years while they poke and prod at the deal to decide whether it's good for them. And then they'll adopt it. At that point, uh, it won't be solving the problem that we started out to solve. It'll be solving 
well, their problem, but uh, not a problem that is necessarily going to do us any good uh, or not a solution that will do us much, much good. It's a very, very conservative <laughs> way of making law, maybe the dumbest possible way to make Internet law. Mm -hmm. uh, just to, I'll, I'll save a lot of my remarks for later mm -hmm. um, when you get to me, but definitely, I mean, I, I think what, what Milton was talking about is this, this issue where, you know, can, can we leave internet governan governance to governments? And how do we build transnational, more multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. types of processes, yet at the same time, uh, um, you know, uh, th there are a lot of real questions about how to do that effectively. I mean, China shows up at ICANN, at the IGF, and says mm -hmm. we represent the Chinese people. And while ICANN and the IGF are multi-stakeholder institutions in different ways, or the IGF, how, how multi-stakeholder it is, is of course in question, but Chinese civil society groups don't show up uh, because Lots of reasons, you know. It's it's not in their, it's not good for their health to, to do so, or or you know, um, so so you so you end up having multi-stakeholder institutions where, kind of developed world democracy civil society groups are very vocal, but the uh, dictatorships are represented really only by governments or by state allied companies, and so I think the real challenge for multi-stakeholderism going forward because it, it certainly is, I think, important when thinking about, okay, how do we set up, you know, a, a privacy-respecting set of norms, you know, legal norms, technical norms. It's very important to include the perspectives of people in the developing world uh, who are not on broadband primarily but on mobile phones mm -hmm. or the perspectives of people um, who are dealing with very repressive regimes who may feel that they really need anonymity and, and might have some very uh, important things to say in response to those in democracies who, who are advocating for law enforcement purposes to have greater authentication. Mm -hmm. um, but you're not getting those voices into the mix. And so there's, there's a real question about how to get those voices mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. mix. Um, when when multi-stakeholder institutions even have trouble getting those voices in, into the mix. Um, and, and how we do it, I don't have a good answer, really. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, it, it was very interesting with, with Google uh, moving its, its Chinese language search engine out of China. You know, that, that's a kind of an interesting case where they have this constituency and they're trying to act in the interest of, of that constituency that doesn't sort of have a voice. But, it, you know, again, how you, how you play that out, uh, there, are, there are just a lot of, of questions for how the interests of, of people who are not represented by their governments um, get, get noticed and incorporated both within gov governance structures as well as corporate norms and practices. It's a real challenge. David, do you want to add anything? Well, I'll, I'll just comment on, on maybe the small subset of the copyright infringement part of this. Um, I wouldn't want to turn over enforcement of copyright rights to an international body any more than I would want uh, to disassemble the DEA or our military and ask an international group to protect our rights with regard to drug trafficking or terrorism. Mm -hmm. I would hope in this country um, we have the healthiest and strongest respect for the work of creators and would be a leader in that area and wouldn't necessarily defer to perhaps the interests of other countries who are net takers of our intellectual property whereas in this country we generate quite a bit of that ourselves, which is not only importantly economically, but culturally. And so I uh, would not be supporting of trying to enforce intellectual property rights by in any way declining what we do in this country with our, with our own approach. So let, let me give Milton a, a final word on, on this um, series of discussions. Um, if... if um, if intermediaries are, are taking these kind of steps, and they're doing so roughly in the context of um, the interests and needs of the local jurisdictions where they're, where they're housed, uh, aren't we back to, the, to the, the bordered internet, where each jurisdiction exerts control over its local intermediaries, and the vision of a, of a, of a transnational communications network 
that's responsive to the interests and needs of the users and providers of, the, of these internet services, that vision goes away because the intermediaries function essentially as expressions of the interest and needs of, of territorial governments. If we can't go international to use transnational organizations of governments to fix the problem, aren't we left with the bordered internet and isn't that contrary to the vision of a transnational communications community? I guess I'm missing a step in your logic. You're assuming then that if we don't work through intergovernmental international institutions that we are working through local intermediaries. And uh, I would say there's a big difference between a globalized or multinational uh, intermediary. First of all, I'm not sure I accept the, the premise that we have to work through intermediaries. Um, for example, ICANN is a regulatory system that doesn't uh, really, it has its own sets of rules, although it does in some ways work through intermediaries. But uh, getting back to the bigger question um, of the bordered internet, I'm, I'm totally against that. I think that's, that's the value add that, that happened. The, the, ab, the ability to uh, create information services that don't require permissions and licenses at the national level. And of course, this relied very heavily on the liberalization of the telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, that's an essential component of the free internet. And uh, we've seen how China has, has really controlled its intermediaries by uh, very heavily restricting and licensing who can get into the, get into the market. So I think the, the bigger question is, where do we want to create actually new collective action institutions at the global level? And that, I understand that's a scary prospect, having dealt with ICANN, you know, <laughs> for, uh, for 10 years. Uh, uh, but I think, you know, maybe it's a liberal leap of faith that I'd rather see that happen on a bottom-up basis than uh, from a top-down basis with governments. And I'd rather see sort of the ethic, the default position of the existing Internet where things are reasonably free kind of st as our starting point rather than uh, trying to revert back to an intergovernmental negotiation. Okay, um, let, let me move on to David because I, I want to I want to give him a chance to focus a little bit on the the sort of second topic uh, in our series of challenges to internet freedom, um, which is um, uh, efforts by government to require intermediaries of one kind or another to take steps uh, against copyright infringement. Um, the U.S. Congress is involved in some of this in international fora. There's increasing reliance on uh, graduated response regimes where ISPs and other intermediaries are required to take uh, increasingly stringent steps uh, to control copyright violations. Um, well, any comments on this and, and, and where the balance is between the need to preserve the openness and freedom of, of, the, of the internet uh, and the need to control copyright violations that take place there? Sure. Um, I also don't accept the premise that there is a tension between Internet freedom and protecting intellectual property rights. I think fundamentally when you have theft or crimes occurring, um, you no longer have to deal with some of the issues with regard to freedom because by definition you've now broken the law. Um, representing songwriters, it's particularly challenging um, because I think that of all the different copyright or intellectual property industries, the music industry has been hit the hardest by the inherent nature of our product. Songwriters are at the bottom of that economic chain, so they've been hit the hardest in the industry that's been hit the hardest. And then, um, to be completely honest, the music industry has made some classically unwise decisions in tackling these challenges. Um, one of the things that's very attractive about the new legislative ideas is that it should be something that the internet community and the content community can work together about because it provides a certain level of security and safety for the internet community to not have to be the ones that actually do the policing themselves. The whole concept behind the legislation that we're talking about is that the Justice Department would in the first instance make it a termination that a particular site traffics primarily in illegal content. If that determination's been made, 
then all we're asking the internet community to do is to cooperate with that government determination and really deal with the three choke points of how people are making money by stealing from songwriters. And that is the search engines that take you there, the online advertising that advertises there, and the credit card companies that process payments. If an illegal site can't take advantage of those three things, they're not going to be able to profit by stealing from content owners. But yet, unless we have that type of government designation, I think it is unfair and burdensome to ask an internet service provider or a search engine to make those determinations themselves. And so the beauty behind this new concept is that it really does provide a certain level of safety and security by having the government do it first. And then all that site is doing is really responding to a government designation where they shouldn't really have a problem. And you, you oftentimes get into these tensions about whether internet service providers or others have any duty or responsibility to take these types of actions themselves without government prompting. And it's always a very tricky question because they often will act as rational actors. Sometimes it's in their interest to do things. If you go to YouTube, you will not find pornography. However, you will find rampant infringement of copyright. Now, why is that? It's because YouTube makes the determination that it's in its interest to remove pornographic materials. It has the ability to do it. It spends the money and resources to do it. You won't find it there. But yet, it actually finds to its advantage to have people infringe copyrights on the site because that's why many people go to the site is to view copyrighted material that hasn't been licensed. So you put these companies in very interesting positions when sometimes they're acting in their own self-interest when it comes to these types of issues. With the COICA legislation, it removes a lot of that type of discretion and instead makes a very simple determination about whether a particular site is a rogue site. And if it is, then you would think there should be no legitimate reason why the internet would want to take users to a place where it's been designated that illegal activity happens. And that's not really infringing freedom because we don't tolerate that type of criminality in any place else. We get some people would defend the right to engage in this criminal behavior just because it happens over an internet line. And that's where I think we leave the discussion um, between what is, what is fair and rational to a discussion where you really can't have any exchange of ideas because anyone who wants to defend the idea that the rules of criminality and right and wrong are different just because they occur over an internet line instead of in a store or any place else then I think you've lost the ability to have a rational discussion about it. But I'm hopeful that the COICA legislation is an area where the two sides can come together and agree that this is a rational way to deal with the massive problem. I think the first speaker somewhat tried to minimize the idea that copyright infringement is really a problem at all or we, we can't do anything to solve it. I will tell you that it is a very important problem for people who make their living creating things like songwriters, and there is something we can do about it. We absolutely can do something about it. You have a shoplifting problem in stores where people walk in, steal something, but it's not nearly the type of problem that you have with theft over the internet. And that's for all kinds of reasons. But one of them is because you have thousands upon thousands of local security, police, prosecutors dealing with theft when it occurs in a physical format. When it comes to theft over internet lines, which is uniquely a federal crime with copyright infringement, you have almost no enforcement, almost no chance of being caught. Is it any wonder that kids sitting in their bedrooms don't worry or think it's wrong to steal over the internet? Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful this new legislation will help point us in the right direction. So that, uh, the, the, the direct question on, on this one is typically due process. So um, uh, under the legislation uh, and under similar efforts where, where um, uh, you know, administration officials are working informally with, um, with internet intermediaries, you know, to identify sites, you know, that they'll say, you know, we've all learned that this site is a bad site or someone complains to the Justice Department and the Justice Department in terms of that it's a bad site. W what, if, what if the site doesn't think it's a bad site? What, I, what, I what, agree what completely. If what if, what if there's a, a process problem sure. and they want to complain that they've been falsely accused. I agree completely that you cannot have a law drawn where good actors or mostly innocent actors get caught up in this trap of being then targeted a rogue site. Um, and I think that's possible to happen is that you could have legitimate sites where you have illegal infringement activity going on despite their best efforts or perhaps they just, uh, you know, it, it's a minority part of what happens on the site. That's not what this legislation is about. 
This legislation targets sites that are primarily engaged in the trafficking of illegal content. And it provides for due process if those sites want to come forward and defend their activity. And I welcome them to do that. We're not talking about a situation like an eBay where someone happens to sell a stolen good on the site and someone would go after an eBay. That type of situation couldn't trap an eBay into the law's reach. We're talking about sites that, if we're being honest, are designed around theft and are almost entirely about theft. And I welcome those sites to come forward and, if they think they've been wrongly accused, to go through a process to, mm -hmm. to challenge that designation by the Justice Department. But I don't think that's going to be a significant concern because I would bet you that, um, that every site that's designated, in fact, will know it's an illegal site and won't actually challenge the designation. Uh, any other comments? Let other panelists jump in here. I, I have a quick yeah. yeah. I, I can't quite agree um, that um, you can say we don't have to deal with Internet freedom because uh, copyright has been violated. Uh, first of all, you're presuming that you know who did it, and you're presuming that you know that what they did was against the law. The problem with a lot of this intermediary uh, copyright uh, regulation is that we all get treated as criminals, and they regulate not the person committing the crime or and impose costs on the person committing a crime, but they regulate my access and the DNS service providers, and they, in effect, attempt to re-engineer the entire Internet infrastructure in order to kind of um, architecturally stop certain forms of crime. And we've seen this uh, in, in uh, ICANN also, where we try to say, you know, we're, we're not going to give you a top-level domain unless you do certain kinds of things. Uh, this is a, a much more intrusive form of regulation than simply identifying a copyright infringer, catching them, and prosecuting them. And you can take that analogy to its logical extreme. Um, it is no different than when combating things like, say, drug trafficking or prostitution, where you would shut down locations that engage in, in prostitution or drug trafficking, and you would separately have enforcement actions going against individuals who break the law. But this idea of freedom is the equivalent of saying that someone has a right to walk into a prostitution house or has a right to walk into a drug sale house, and it's not fair to them if the government shut down that house because they're engaged in illegal activity. That's not a freedom that really exists. You have a right to go where you want. You don't necessarily have a right to visit a house of prostitution or drug trafficking. Stuart. So I, uh, I, I guess I should confess some of my biases, because otherwise Jerry will have to uh, uh, explain them. But I, on the question of WikiLeaks, I, I think that, the, that WikiLeaks was an astonishingly irresponsible thing that uh, 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 Brad Manning should go to jail for the rest of his natural life, and that uh, WikiLeaks should never have published those documents. They're going to endanger a lot of people. They're going to do untold damage. Uh, uh, and was it was an act, by and large, I think, of anti-American animus. If you only look at the early releases, you can see that that was the intent. So I'm very hostile to what WikiLeaks did. What I'm astonished by is that... Um, sites that have hosted large amounts of WikiLeaks documents would never in a million years host Rihanna's latest album. Now, that's because uh, they will get takedown notices and if they don't and they're, uh, uh, the, the people who provide them with web service will get takedown notices saying you've got illegal content take it down or we'll take you down. And they will, if it's Rihanna, they'll, they'll take it down in a heartbeat. Uh, WikiLeaks, you know, government documents whose release will do far more damage and are far more dangerous to our social fabric than the uh, pirating of Rihanna's latest album got nothing like that protection. I think we, we have a very peculiar set of legal priorities already where we give more protection to uh, uh, popular culture than to uh, national security. Uh, I do think at the, in the long run, uh, it is true that the uh, intellectual property forces, like it or not, many of the people here probably don't like it, are going to be pioneering, along with the Scientologists, pioneering 
internet control mechanisms, because they feel so strongly about this and are so determined a, uh, uh, an influencer of legislation. But it's inevitable that the uh, constraints that I identified that said, does it make any sense that WikiLeaks documents get somehow less, uh, well, get more protection uh, uh, than uh, uh, the alternative uh, mechanisms, uh, that that's, uh, that makes no sense, and we ought to address that problem directly. Thank you. On, on, the, um, on the contrast, I think it's a, a great point that the, the legal structures differ dramatically. Um, but what's, what's your take on the reaction of the intermediaries, uh, at least the, the, the very public um, uh, actions, uh, from the payment processors and the, the web hosts who, um, after uh, it became clear that, that they were processing transactions for WikiLeaks and that they were hosting the sites where WikiLeaks uh, had, had some of these documents, they said, we don't want to be part of that arrangement. There wasn't any legal compulsion for them to withdraw service. One and all, they made reference to their terms of service. Some of them made reference to the illegality of the underlying conduct. Um, there was no underlying law that they were referring to that compelled them to take that, that action. It wasn't like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, where mm -hmm. if they hadn't done something, uh, then they were subject to uh, take down notice themselves. Or, uh, um, so uh, what, what's your take of that kind of action? It was, it was voluntary. It was uncoerced by government law. Um, not all of the intermediaries did that. Facebook, for example, said no one from government came to us and complained about this, uh, this issue. No one asserted from government that there was a legal problem here. And in the absence of that, we're, we intend to leave uh, their operation within Facebook up. Um, what, what's your take on the, 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 this, this, this action by the intermediaries in that, in that case? Yeah. Well, you know, in, in, we started out with a, a regime of intermediary immunity uh, that was designed to uh, um, uh, monitor uh, posts. We, we, we simply couldn't monitor all the posts, that, all the data that people were putting up, picking up. I think the, the YouTube uh, uh, number now is 35 hours of video every minute go up. That's obviously not something that can be um, screened uh, and identified as uh, uh, this should go, this should go up this shouldn't or so it seemed back in the 90s when we were passing these laws uh, I think what has happened since then is it's become easier and easier to find ways to monitor stuff that's going up on the uh, on the internet that uh, uh, YouTube has a lot of automated processing that identifies stuff that uh, 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 and takes it down sort of provisionally. Uh, uh, the rewards from monitoring users have grown exponentially. It used to be, you say, oh, how could I possibly, you know, I'm, I'm AOL, I get $20 a month, I can't possibly uh, uh, do the monitoring. But increasingly, with behavioral ads and data protection, uh, data, uh, sorry, uh, uh, deep packet inspection, all of those things mean that there's an enormous incentive to develop technology that does uh, screening, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Plus, we're seeing heavy pressure from law enforcement uh, interests designed uh, uh, to uh, gain access to to pressure intermediaries to do more for. Uh, for governments in order to bring a kind of legal pressure to bear on people. Uh, and what we're seeing is increasingly using the tools that they make money off of, using the tools that they have begun to develop under pressure from uh, uh, copyright and other interests. Uh, they are bringing those to bear whenever they feel the heat from governments. And that's almost inevitable. Inevitable? Rebecca, what do you think? Um, on the WikiLeaks question directly. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have a, a difficult situation here where, you know, um, inter private intermediaries are making decisions about what people, you know, can and cannot do on their platforms. And it's within their legal rights to make these decisions. But 
you know, as citizens, our political discourse increasingly depends on this digital layer, um, this digital communications layer. Uh, and if unpopular speech, if controversial speech, if upsetting speech, if, if speech whose legality is in extreme dispute has no way of reaching the public um, because private inter intermediaries are making their own decisions about you know, what's in their interest to, to host and not host or what is, what is compatible with their executives' sensibilities or you know, whatever reason, they don't have to give a reason. Um, then what's happening is that you're, you're you know, it's, it's a slippery slope. You're, you're eroding the ability of, you know, the most unpopular people in a democracy, but who may have a point of view. I mean, you get back to the Federalist Papers, you know, one of, one of, the, one, one, one of the core arguments for you know what one of the essential aspects of American democracy is the ability for people who hold unpopular minority opinions to to have a hearing for those opinions and to have an opportunity to to advocate those opinions amongst the majority and if if we have a situation where private intermediaries are sort of making determinations that oh this this speech you know, may be illegal, or we think it should be illegal, or Joe Lieberman doesn't like it, or you know, Harold Coe doesn't like it. Uh, so it's we're better off taking it down. Um, this is eroding a fundamental aspect of our democracy. So, can, I, can I ask a question? If I own a lecture hall. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, I, I think this guy is utterly irresponsible. I will never rent my lecture hall to him. Isn't that my First Amendment rights? And, and, and how, how do you square that with the notion that there's some responsibility to prevent me from closing off uh, uh, my lecture hall to unpopular speech? But. I mean, with, with the internet, the problem is we have such a, a larger scale, right? Your, your lecture hall is in one place, you know. But when, when you have a situation where increasingly the public discourse is going through all of these lecture halls, mm -hmm. and, you know, most of the people running the lecture halls tend, to, you know, are, are, are basically not inclined to host controversial speech, um, then we have a problem. When, when, when the public square is increasingly run privately, we can't kind of just go out outside the lecture hall into the courtyard because it, in cyberspace there isn't that courtyard. It's, it's the, the privately operated intermediaries. I think, I think the intermediaries and their power and their ability to erode democracy is, is much increased. You know, I, that the, the power that these intermediaries have is nothing like the power in Detroit, when I grew up, that the Detroit News had. They set the agenda. You didn't get a chance to read other views unless you went to the Detroit Free Press, which <laughs> you know, no one read. Uh, it, it, you know, we've lived in worlds where there was a whole lot more private ability to set the media agenda than the one we live in now. Well, can I jump in here? So. This is the point I actually meant to make uh, and lost my train of thought when you asked me about the going back to the bordered internet. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the level of concentration and the level of pluralism in these industries, right? Mm -hmm. So if uh, there's only two cloud service providers and Amazon, uh, under pressure from the U.S. government, decides to yank uh, its hosting capabilities from WikiLeaks, and by the way, I totally disagree with uh, Mr. Baker's take on on the value of the WikiLeaks uh, revelations. Um, then we're we're really in a big a big trouble. The number one, the intermediary themselves starts to take on public responsibilities, uh, or at least have expectations, uh, because we're so dependent upon them. And I'm very familiar with how that plays out with respect mm -hmm. to the monopolization of the telephone industry. Uh, but secondly, um, pluralism is in itself a kind of governance, a kind of defense. So yeah, Stuart can say, I'm not going to give these people a platform, but then I can say, well, I am, and uh, then it gets out there. And uh, I think that's what happened both with the Pentagon Papers and with WikiLeaks is that there was almost an attempt to 
throttle the dissemination to the public, but once it got to one newspaper and then another and then another in the print media world of the 70s, then pretty soon after 17 newspapers, the government basically said, we can't suppress it. And with WikiLeaks, the same thing happened, only on this much more rapid global digital scale. And I think we want to preserve that, even mm -hmm. though, yes, that, that power can be abused. There's no question about the fact that somebody might use internet freedom or internet capabilities to release information that is really harmful and damaging, but it's also possible that they use it in ways that are fundamentally corrective of abuses in, in governments and, and other kinds of uh, institutions. So Milton, can I, can I just ask, and this is a variant of the information wants to be free argument, that uh, it, it is surely easier to release lots and lots of data than it ever was and to spread it around the world much faster. Uh, but unless you believe that all data of all kinds should be free, you have to say, well, then how do we, what do we do to keep the data that shouldn't be released from being released? And right now, WikiLeaks is getting to, ready to release uh, private financial information. And so if you care about privacy, you might be a little uneasy about the consequences of that, unless you decide that they're rich people so you don't care about them. Uh, it, there surely is some point child pornography, whatever you want, where you say, now that's not data that should be freely available, and then the question comes, how do you stop that? It has to be actionable. I mean, uh, if, if indeed uh, somebody releases information that is in fact a violation of people's rights to privacy, then they should be jailed and prosecuted. And, and how about if it's classified information that should not have been released? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, are you saying that you can set up a system that ensures that that will never ever happen? I don't understand what your point is here. The, the, the point is, my we, point we have, is... We, I think my point is that, that you, unless you, uh, you know, sort of surrender to um, what's left of the hippie fringe of the Internet, uh, you have to acknowledge that there is some data that should not be released and you have to have control mechanisms for dealing with that, right? Sure, if, sure. There's, there's no problem with that. What, what we're debating is whether how much of the generalized freedom that we all as, as mostly law-abiding citizens enjoy uh, should be sacrificed in order to stop that one particular unique situation, which is you know, maybe one-tenth or one-one-hundredth of one percent of the kinds of information releases that go, that go on. I mean, the, the challenge, it seems to me, is we, we can all agree child porn. You know, that's, that's the, sort of an easy one. And the financial services industry and ISPs have taken action in, in that area. That's any, but the, the problem is that the, the, the places where intermediaries will make a judgment about what needs to be stopped is going to depend on where they live. It's going to depend on, you know, if they live in the United States, they'll reflect judgments that are largely the judgments that are the dominant judgments in the United States. Uh, and this is, brings me to my question to Rebecca, which is, it's exactly what happens in the case of Chinese intermediaries. Mm -hmm. and, and we look at that and we say, that's a problem. Uh, it's not just that the Chinese keep out information from the rest of the world. It's that they, through lots of informal ways, work with people who are not government actors and persuade them that they're acting in patriotic ways by making sure that certain speech isn't widely available. And they do that in accordance with the, the customs, traditions, norms, values of the country that, that, that they live in. We do the same thing. How, what, what's happened to internet freedom? It just has just become a, a difference between China and the United States and the cultural values and norms peculiar to each each country. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess you, you've got a continuum here. Um, I mean, one big difference with China, of course, that it has a government that has little or no basis in consent of the governed. Uh, it has a legal system with no basis in consent of the governed and has, has, has a, a uh, law enforcement system that has no basis in consent of the governed. Um, so that's, that's one very large difference. Um, that said, I think it's worth looking at the way in which the Chinese government has succeeded in turning private intermediaries into an opaque extension of government power. 
Uh, and, and I think some of the ways in which that has happened uh, need to be kept in mind, I think, on, on, on a more global scale as we're thinking about what are the technical norms, what are the legal norms that need to be globally put in place. And it's not just an informal system. It's, it's, it's really pretty formal that, that, that uh, Chinese companies are required by the government uh, to, to police and censor content, um, police and censor everything their users are, are doing on the networks. Now, they don't do it perfectly because there's a lot of content, but they do it well enough to, to prevent political movements from happening, to, 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 to uh, jail people who did certain things, and, and so on. Um, and, you know, if, if companies do not comply with the orders that they're receiving on a regular basis from a, a range of government agencies, they, get, they lose their license. Um, and so it's very heavy intermediary censorship uh, and, and also uh, <laughs> surveillance carried out by, by intermediaries. In fact, you know, I've spent quite a lot of time studying the way mm -hmm. in which Chinese Internet censorship functions. And, and I, I really have to say that it, it would not possibly succeed without really being financed uh, and carried out largely by the private sector. Um, and this is obviously a very extreme case, but a lot of the censorship um, that happens is actually done in the name of anti-pornography, anti child protection, cracking down on terror because, you know, certain separatists from certain regions are classified as terrorists, crime, you know, fighting crime as defined extremely broadly. Also um, copyright. And, and copyright, yeah. yeah. And, and there have been a number of cases where, where sites have been shut down that, it, yeah, there was some copyright violation going on them, but there was also some interesting dissident activity going, happening on them, so it was very convenient. Um, so, so you, you know, it, one has to be very careful, I think, about the excuses one is providing dictatorships in, in, in kind of setting up certain kinds of, of regimes. But, but to, to move more to the problems of democracies, which are obviously a lot more subtle, mm -hmm. um, what, what I worry about is the creation of greater opacity in this layer, in this digital layer that we're all depending on now for everything, a weakening, a weakening of, of legal process, a weakening of due process, uh, a weakening, weakening of transparency and accountability in terms of the citizen knowing who is collecting it, what information about them, how it's being accessed, how it's going to be used, uh, in terms of knowing what websites are being blocked, perhaps, you know, by, you know, order of a democratically elected parliament, how do you appeal, how do you even know what's going on? It just seems that increasingly there's more and more opacity, and, and with a lot of the measures that democratic societies are enacting for admirable reasons. You know, we want to protect our business, we want to protect our children, we want to, we, we want to keep ourselves safe. Um, we're, we're introducing a layer of opacity in the relationship between government and citizen mm -hmm. um, and a murkiness in, in process that, that troubles me. Um, it troubles me a great deal, and and I I just wonder, it, you know, I, we we keep kind of going. So many of the debates kind of go back and forth between you know you guys are the hippies and you guys are the fascists, and, and that's not what it's about, right? This is you know we're we're all just trying to figure out you know this is this is about governance. I think we all agree that we need governance. You need governance in the real world, or you get a Hobbesian state of nature, mm -hmm. and you need some governance in in you need governance in the digital world, or you have the digital equivalent of a Hobbesian state of nature. Mm -hmm. So it's not about you know we just want some hippie free for all here uh, necessarily. Although I'm inclined. To agree with with Milton that I'd, I'd I'd rather have a state of nature than than you know uh, certain kinds of, of lockdown dictatorships. But but that said, um, you know it's it's how do we how do we build a system of governance in this globally interconnected system of networks that we have that is really accountable to all of its users, all of the people on, who are using the network, mm -hmm. that is accountable to their interests, respectful of their rights, uh, and that, that really enables this network to be as empowering as possible mm -hmm. 
while also enabling people to have, you know, a, 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 you know the, the kind of governance and security that they expect. But just as in the physical world, if you want 100% safety, if you want 0% crime, you know, there, there's a cost that democratic societies have chosen, have decided is not worth paying. Right. Um, and, and so I think the real challenge for, for the United States particularly is to figure out, you know, how can we really take the lead um, in a global conversation, particularly amongst democracies, of how do we build the right model for protecting civil liberties on the one hand and and fighting crime and, and mm -hmm. protecting property on the other in a, in a way that really works, um, you know, both from a law enforcement and a civil liberties point of view. I mean, we've got to be able to balance both um, adequately. We've got to be able to figure out how to upgrade our politics and sort of innovate legally. I think we're, we're going to, I think part of the problem is, is that our existing legal approaches and structures, you know, there's a lot that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's going to require a lot of innovation, but it's, it's certainly encouraging to hear our government officials saying that, you know, security and, and civil liberties are equally important. We need to find the right way forward. Stuart. So let's remember how we got here. Uh, the, um, the people that we're now criticizing for having terms of service that uh, are opaque or uh, unnecessarily draconian are by and large the organizations that did bring massive amounts of information not previously available to a whole bunch of parts of the world that uh, uh, had strict newspaper and media controls. Uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, notwithstanding that that sometimes leads them to be uh, disinclined to support every form of speech uh, available, they are also subject to a lot of pressure that pushes them against enforcement of the law. Let's not forget that uh, uh, Twitter is, um, was able to invoke Icelandic protection uh, uh, as a way of resisting uh, the 2703D order they got. SWIFT was um, punished severely for complying with U.S. law, perfectly legal U.S. subpoena, uh, and, and they essentially stopped complying because of pressure from the European Union. The same is true, it didn't work out as well, uh, in the fight over whether airlines are going to provide travel reservation data about people, this is near and dear to my heart, uh, uh, travel reservation data about people flying into the United States. Again, the European Union said, hey, you're a multinational carrier. We think we might punish you for helping the U.S. with its anti-terrorism campaign. Uh, and uh, that led to a crisis that actually pulled back some of the U.S. controls. So these are fragile, you know, uh, the, the, uh, mechanisms that on the whole have produced an information revolution we, uh, but are subject to some limits. The idea that we can kind of come up with a way of getting rid of the disadvantages strikes me as pretty dubious. So what do you do? You either write laws telling them they have an obligation to protect minority speech. What is this, the fairness doctrine back again? That's, that's what they did in Detroit uh, when I was growing up. That's what uh, guaranteed us that some namby-pamby uh, Sunday morning uh, contrary view would be presented. Uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, whenever the government tells you they're going to tell you how to do speech, you kind of have to worry whether that's going to work out so well. The alternative is private sector, private organizations, civil society so-called, uh, uh, which utterly lacks democratic legitimacy. It's just a bunch of pressure groups and people who happen to have the money and the interest and the time to fuss over a particular topic. And in the long run, uh, notwithstanding EFF showing up, uh, I'm guessing David's going to show up more often I, and is going to spend more money to try to make sure that his version of civil society wins that debate. I'm just not sure that either of those mechanisms for addressing the problem that we see here is likely to do a lot of good, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure I would pursue either of those very far. And anything in the area of uh, transparency and due process, that, uh, responding to Rebecca's concern, you know, especially in the area of, of copyright, there, there, there seems to be 
that is the constant refrain. It, if this were all out in the open, everyone had a fair chance to defend themselves and what's the problem. But if it's done secretly behind closed doors, there's no appeal rights, then we've we got a problem. Can that well, I, be generalized as a I, way to approach the issue? I appreciate the confidence and the lobbying ability of songwriters, but <laughs> we're not just arguing against extremist anti-copyright academics anymore. We're arguing against giant corporate interests who are funding those types of organizations. And it's not true that we show up more often anymore. Um, the truth of the matter is the bulk of the money and the lobbying is spent on behalf of economic interests that, that oftentimes profit from the theft of copyright. And you talk about we're not going to get to a zero crime rate environment. And in the area of copyright, if you were to say to the music industry that we'll give you a system that produces that only 50% of your intellectual property will be stolen. We would celebrate if we got to only 50% because the vast majority, more than 90% plus on America's iPods is con contains stolen songs where the songwriters didn't make a penny from that economic activity. And so I don't think we're asking for a, a, a place where we don't have uh, the ability for someone to object to the designation that they're a, an illegal site or to get to a zero kind of crime. We're trying to get to a place where songwriters can just make a living and that they can survive, and that's not the case today. Mm -hmm. And um, the truth of the matter is, is that if you go to any of these illegal sites and you type in the name Rihanna, you will find all of her works available for free and a complete inability under our current legal system to shut down those sites in an effective way. It just doesn't happen. So it's plain whack-a-mole, where you might be able to go after one or two and get a high-profile court victory, but you can't stop the theft of Rihanna's music and the people who write the music for Rihanna. And that's the reality today. Let me stop our internal discussion right now and see if there's any um, series of questions from our friends in the, in the audience. Jerry, you want to jump in? I want to ask about... There's a microphone there if you want to use it. I, I think I can speak loud enough. I just want to ask the question. <clears throat> we, we can hear you, but they can't hear you. Stuart, I'd, I'd like to ask you about the, the WikiLeaks issue and um, kind of looking at the music industry and COICA, or at least that scheme of going after lot, the, the music industry. Are you thinking that, that, that there is a way to, to go in that direction towards dealing with WikiLeaks? Um, in other words, to really say, this is kind of classified information, well, sure, which is kind of like copyright I would, I, information. I would do it before I would do it to protect you know, pop music. Probably. Right, OK, but now so you've got I, to so press Yes, it. I would do it. But I, 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 it doesn't sound particularly effective. I mean, you go to court or you go to uh, the uh, bureaucracy in the Justice Department, and they grind away saying, yeah, this is a, a site that we've decided is a bad site. And everybody says, oh, okay, we'll stop doing business with them. And they change their name and they start up again. I'm just not sure how effective that is as a mech. And you grind, start grinding away again. Uh, I, I, I don't see that working in the WikiLeaks context, and I'm kind of skeptical it's going to work for uh, uh, well, David either. The reason I asked the question was simply to try to get more concrete, because it's only when you take a problem and you say, well, I've got a solution for it, or I think I'm in there, that you can make a judgment about whether we are going to have a free and open internet, depending on the solution you've chosen for the problem so, so, so you I, I, I will offer you one concrete uh, solution that I propose that uh, might even get uh, a certain amount of uh, support here. I don't think that the DMCA should be available to the guy who publishes Julian Assange's um, uh, uh, autobiography. Uh, if somebody wants to post that and uh, uh, make it available for free, we should all say fine. You know, I, and uh, uh, he, he believes in free information, so do we for him. In the back. Hi, so um, my name's Dan Kaminsky. I'm an engineer of uh, some repute in the DNS world. And um, I've been kind of interested listening to this discussion because there's a lot of discussion about whether there's a choice, whether you could actually uh, make a significant dent in the piracy rate by passing COICA. And um, you know, as an engineer, I looked at this and 
so did 89 other internet engineers, and we all looked at the bill and basically said, flat out, this will not work. Like, the amount of work necessary to bypass all the work involved in Koika is approximately 60 seconds to change a single setting. And then all of it goes away. Um, so I'm kind of interested on two fronts. First, I'm interested, has there been significant effort to figure out how effective these particular changes would be? And second, has there been significant effort to really understand the potential side effects? As internet engineers, we look at this request and see a tremendous ask to re-architect our networks for something that doesn't appear to be effective. And at the end of the day, I come from a cybersecurity standpoint, really limits our ability to protect and monitor uh, the users, which frankly are about to be innocent victims in an ongoing cyber war. Right. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, and forgive me, I'm not familiar with your level of repute in the, in the industry, but I don't think that anyone believes there's a solution for hardcore thieves who are intent on stealing copyrights. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna stop them. The, the nature of, of digital files is simply such that if someone is intelligent enough and is dedicated to stealing, they're gonna be able to steal. I think that our efforts are designed to go after the much larger population of folks who do it maybe more in an area where they don't necessarily have the technological background that you do. They may not share a commitment to stealing that some others do. And we're trying to make it more difficult, particularly for young people that are learning how to access music about going to legal sites. And so no one has claimed that the COICA bill will stop theft. But I do believe that if you make it more difficult, particularly for unsophisticated, non-committed criminals, then you might make a significant dent in the amount of theft that goes on if at the same time the industry does its part and provides good legal services that are an alternative. And that's the goal of the bill. So to just jump in there, I think the, the difference of perspective here is um, uh, speaking from uh, the technical perspective, Mr. Kaminsky th believes that the fundamental operations of the Internet should have an integrity that when you make a query to a DNS server, you get the correct answer. That is correct. And uh, he's concerned about not only the fact that you're messing with that, but you're messing with it in one country, and other countries might choose to do it in their own unique way, and pretty soon we don't have a global internet, a globally interoperable internet, and that's uh, a concern that I share. And, and let me ask you a question. Uh, given that you may have, you know, you appear to have a certain level of intelligence about how to tackle these problems, and I'm just going to assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're not a committed person to the idea of stopping the theft of copyrights, what would you do if, if the government came to you and said, we have a tremendous problem with child porn sites, and we'd like your help in stopping people who are just surfing the net, looking for child porn, of reaching a place where they're gonna find it in a safe, easy way. I believe that it is awful to correlate child porn and Rihanna. I, I think I'm that sure any do. discussion that connects the two is frankly offensive. And that's because you think one is criminal and the other is not, probably. And while I'm not equating them in terms of the degree of criminality, the point I think has been made, which is if they're both criminal and we have an obligation to try to stop both types of infringements while one may be worse than the other, that doesn't mean you don't go after the one that's less worse. But, but the methods used by the Internet Watch Foundation to identify and take down child porn has been very successful. And that's largely because you've had the cooperation of the other players involved because they have an economic interest in doing that, whereas with copyright infringement, many of the players don't have an economic interest in cooperating. In fact, they have the opposite economic interest. They make more money when people access the lines to steal. And that's been part of the problem. So from a, a strictly descriptive standpoint, though, um, it is unlikely that we will see large-scale alterations of people's internet configuration so that they can access child pornography. It is, however, the flip side of the popularity of pirated content is a lot of people have a very aggressive desire to access it in a way that is fundamentally different than child pornography mm -hmm. in sense of scale, just in sense of scale. And, um, yeah, that, that, that does sort of summarize the, 
the, the, okay. the key aspect of that debate. But let, let, let me, let me, we're, we're almost out of time in, in, the, in this panel, so let me thank the questioner and sure. see if there's uh, any uh, uh, final remarks that our panelists want to want to make in this area. Starting with starting with Rebecca at the end, and then just you know, no more than a minute, please. Um, I guess I wasn't planning for final remarks. You can nope. cut me slightly, but uh, no, I mean these these are tough issues. But I, I, I think what's really important is, is, well, there's a lot of things, a lot of things that need to be kept in mind, but we need to be mindful of the fact that whatever we're doing legally and technically here in the United States to resolve our problems in our context are having implications for Internet users all over the world. And if, if we mean what we say about Internet freedom, we really need to be thinking about what kinds of precedents we're setting, what kinds of technical environments we're creating, and what the, the implications are going to be for all users everywhere, because there, there are tremendously serious unintended consequences, I think, for, for some, of the, some, some of the proposals that are made in good, for good faith reasons in democracies today. Yeah. Stuart. Yeah, I, I, I think we went through 10 years where the internet was spreading and it was American technology and American innovators who were driving it and we came to confuse the internet with American values in fundamental ways. And now that the internet is truly global, it's also truly local, and there is an Italian internet, and the Italians expect it to reflect Italian values, and if it doesn't reflect Italian values, then Google's execs are going to jail in Italy. Uh, and we, we need to, develop a little bit of humility the, uh, about what is the technology and what just happened to be the values of the headquarters comp comp headquarters of the companies that drove it. Uh, and so we're going through a long educational process of discovering that a lot of things that we thought were inherent in the internet are not inherent in the internet and that we um, at lo long last are going to have to acknowledge our role as a minority on the internet. David, final comments. I guess, well, for those of us who are against child porn, I guess what we've just heard is that it's lucky it's not more popular, because if it were, we couldn't do anything about it. Um, I fundamentally don't accept that. Um, I'm not sure why this has turned into such a Rihanna bashing session. Um, <laughs> I think she's great. Say the, 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 truth the, the truth of the matter is that, that while Rihanna has the right to have her property respected, I'm much more concerned about the thousands and thousands of songwriters who are not popular and who are not well known and are trying to make a living by creating art. And they're the ones that are finding it harder and harder in today's environment to just do what they love and which provides so much value to the world. And so I'm hopeful that at least with uh, some of the new discussion that's going on, we've moved beyond a point where we are enemies with the internet and we can somehow find a way to become partners in doing what should be done, which is providing a legal, safe, environment to access music and other copyrighted content in a way that makes sense economically and socially and, and morally with the issues of freedom. Milton, final comments. Well, I'll have some fun and pick up on Mr. Baker's um, last comment. Um, so Italy is, as a unit of governance, is actually a very recent construct. And as probably some of you know, it was, it was cobbled together through a bunch of uh, uh, ridiculously small principalities uh, not very long ago and the idea that the internet a global communication infrastructure with all its potentialities has to fit into the Procrustean bed of a nation state I think is something we need to question and uh, this discussion has become a little too focused I think on the intermediary question there are there are uh, that's one of the big governance issues but uh, we do need to think about the internet, I think, as a whole when we're talking about governance, and that's the point I'm trying to make. So um, we're done. Um, there's a coffee break downstairs for those of you who want uh, some refreshment. Uh, there'll be a, another breakout session here at 3.30. It's the clouding of internet policy, a perfect storm for U.S. security and privacy policy. Come back up here for that one. And please join me in thanking our panel for a stimulating discussion.